Yep. Well, good morning, and uh, once again, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the opportunity of staying connected with my favorite church. In fact, this last week, I was up in Post Falls, Idaho, and I found myself quoting Carla Van Vost again on marriage. So probably the majority of, uh, the vast majority of people I quote is still a part of the Turner Christian Church. And I just want to start off uh, once again this morning by saying, how do we enter into 2021? I know we're into uh, the year at least three months in, but today what I want to talk about is just the value of having joy in our life. During uh, World War II, a guy by the name of Abraham Wall was given the task, and they would, when all the different aircrafts would come in, and I'm guessing that probably the two pilots or three pilots that are part of the church, or maybe half a dozen pilots there at Turner Christian Church. You probably already know what's going on. But Abraham Wall was given the uh, task of uh, charting where all the bullet holes hit the different planes when they came back successfully from an air raid. And he was given the task of deciding, how do you keep these planes up in the air? What's the strategy to keep them in the air? So the immediate reaction was, we want to put extra armor where all these bullet holes are. If we can do that, and I'm hoping that you have something that looks like this in your hands on Sunday morning, but this is the first time that survivorship bias is documented. Abraham Wall came to his team and said, wait a minute, these planes made it back. What he's saying is, this means that a plane can survive being hit here. The place where you need to put the extra armor is where the bullet holes aren't. That shows that the planes that got hit here didn't make it back. If you take a shot in these areas, you might not return. Every one of us here this morning, in fact, you could turn to your neighbor and you could tell them what happened in 2020. A lot of us were shot in a lot of different ways. But I want to say, welcome to 2021. You made it. You survived your mission. But a lot of us here this morning, and you feel a lot like this picture. You've got bullet holes everywhere. You've got some financial holes. You got some big holes. You got some small holes. You got some racial holes. A lot of us can think of election holes, presidential holes. All of us during 2020 were affected by COVID. We got COVID holes. And then the crazy thing is, if you look closely at this picture, you can see different types of holes. You can see that maybe some of us experienced some friendly fire. People who are close to us pulled out a gun, and they just shot a couple of rounds through the fuselage. Maybe some of you can look back at 2020, and you can think of your son or daughter, and they spent seven to ten days doing nothing but taking stupid pills. You got bullet holes everywhere, but we're still here. We're still standing. You landed in 2021, so what you and I need to do is look and learn. And we know that there are times when enemy fire will take us out, but too often we take ourselves out. And so what I want us to do is I want us to take a look at our own lives here this morning and ask the question, where do we need to put some extra armor? At the end of 2020, if you're like me, you were wore down. And if we're not careful, we can stop believing that God is the one who actually provides. Do you ever stop and think why it is that the Bible talks so often about endurance? Why is it that the Bible talks about the power of the Spirit? You and I know, especially after 2020, we need endurance. The battle is always longer than we want it to be, and you and I are going to need His power to accomplish His mission. And when I once again want to remind you, you cannot have godly fruit without godly power. If we're not careful, at the end of a year like last year, we begin to write ourselves permission slips. We begin to excuse ourselves and say, well, I can get away and do this because of this. I'm going to eat poorly. I'm going to live unhealthy. Or maybe a lot of us just placed ourselves in isolation. 
if we're not careful, we've allowed ourselves to become angry and short-tempered. And if you're like me, I'd find myself making excuses. I have all this pressure going on. But once again, I want to remind you here this morning, there was no bait and switch from Jesus. Jesus said when you and I crossed over that line of faith, Jesus said when you and I were baptized into Christ, it was going to be hard. Jesus said, blessed are you when people hate you. For some reason, we lost sight of expecting that. Galatians 5, known as the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, we lose our perspective. In fact, I would just step back and ask you, if you didn't want to live in 2020, what era would you rather live in? They didn't even have toilet paper in the 1800s. You think about the turmoil that existed in our country in the 60s and the 70s. Maybe you and I actually are living in the best of times and not the worst of time. A lot of us have read Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, and you and I believe that we've been put here on purpose, for a purpose, to step into His divine calling to take ground. And yet, if you're like me, I found myself in 2020 doing a lot of complaining even though I was quarantined in an air-conditioned house. You know, I've always had a heart for missionaries and always had a heart for missions. And I think about a lot of our missionaries, 2020 didn't even make the top five of their worst years. Paul wrote in Hebrews chapter 12 to keep fixing her eyes on Jesus so you and I have got to get into 2021. We've got to continue through 2021 and not be afraid of taking some bullet holes. You and I have got to believe that God can get us through anything. It's not faith in our own wisdom. It's not faith in our own leadership. It is faith in Jesus. A good friend of mine, Clayton, writes this, too often I want to have the faith of Abraham without having to leave a place for that that God would reveal. I want the recognition of Abraham without having to walk my son up Mount Moriah. I want the leadership of Moses without having to deal with Pharaoh. I want the deliverance that Moses experienced without having to stand in front of the Red Sea. I want to see the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, but I don't want to spend any time in the desert. I want to have the victory of David, but I don't want to have to face Goliath. I don't want to call down the fire from heaven, but I don't want to stand alone in front of the 500 or 450 adversaries. I want the strength of Samson, but I don't want to fight the Philistines. I want the glory of Gideon, but I don't want to use the weapon that God has given me. I want the influence of Daniel, but I don't want to live in exile. I want the prominence of Daniel, but I don't want the prayer life of Daniel. I want the testimony of shutting the mouths of lions, but I don't want the experience of a lion's den. I want the power of Paul, but I don't want to experience the flogging. I want the preaching of Peter, but I don't want the prison time. I want the blessings of Christ, but I don't, do not want to share in his sufferings. Have you ever thought about this? Quite often, God does his biggest work in the midst of our biggest challenges. You and I want to experience a mighty movement of God, but we do not want to have an adversary. You and I want to experience a mighty movement of God, but we don't want to place ourselves in such a situation, find ourselves in a place where God is the only one that can rescue us. So today what I want to do is I want to just talk to you about what it means to live in joy. I want you, to, you and I to take what we've been going through and put some positive things, and I just want you to put the two words over it. To have peace over panic, light over darkness, life over death, joy over despair. I just want you to put God over it all. You remember when the angels appeared to the shepherds, I bring you good news of great joy. And what was the great joy? It was the good news of a Savior. It was the good news of a Messiah. It was the good news of Emmanuel, God with us, the Almighty God, Prince of Peace. And obviously, you and I know Jesus is the one to whom this is written about. 
These words would echo when Jesus would say, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. So really, as you and I kind of round the corner, the first corner in the first quarter of 2021, I want every one of you to be full of it in a good way. I want your life to be more than what is falsely portrayed on Facebook. I'm just hoping that your life will be overflowing with purpose and patience and kindness and generosity. That you and I in 2021 can live with a spirit that's free to take risk and to soar and to dance and to laugh. My prayer for you up and down the high line and there on the big flat is that God will give you life so that you'll be absolutely full of joy. In John chapter 15, verse 11, I've told you this so that you, that my joy may be in you and your, my joy may be complete. I think what Paul or what Jesus is saying there as you move and as you love, I just want you to represent me. I want you to be known as men and women full of joy. So if I were to ask you the question here this morning, what are you known for? Some of you are known as a great vocalist. Some of you can make incredible barbecue. Some of you are known for your basketball ability or your creative. You can absolutely build anything. You're good at working on cars. You're good at farming. But what are you known for? Would you be known for someone who is filled with joy? When your name comes up in a conversation, they say that person always looks at the best. He always radiates contentment, always positive. That individual is always kind to other people. Doesn't matter what's going on, just doesn't seem to stress out. That person can laugh and sing. And I wonder, do people say, whatever he's got, I want some of that. Would you be known for joy? Are you full of it? It's not something you have to pretend, but joy runs deep within you. I'll never forget when Susie and I were living in Haver, Montana, and one of my good friends was a guy named, by the name of Kevin Kime. Kevin was having some health issues and took me out fishing one day. And as we're fishing, he said, uh, I think I've got Lou Gehrig's. Been doing the research. I've just discovered that this is what it's going to be. And so I said, Kevin, you just got to get right with God. And he said, well, once I get through this, then I want to get baptized. And I'll never forget, we were driving down the road, and as we're driving in front of Master Sports, I said to Kevin, why are you waiting? And he said, you're right, let's do it. And I remember that Kevin refused to take on any of the kind of the pain medication because he wanted to experience it all. And during that time, I did some research, and I found out that quite often people that came down with Lou Gehrig's disease were very athletic, and Kevin was one of those guys and he had a six-pack. I mean, he loved to hunt. He loved to fish. He loved to go hiking. This guy was in incredible shape. And I would say to Kevin, well, you got a six-pack. I've got a keg. And Kevin would say, I'd rather have your keg. But all through that whole season, when he was fighting with uh, ALS and when he lost the battle, he never once lost the battle to joy. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And I just want you to notice this is a command. It's an imperative. This is not a suggestion to Paul. He's saying this needs to happen. It's like when Paul says, don't lie. Don't plot revenge. It's a command. And then Paul does something here that he very rarely does anywhere else. He repeats himself. In fact, I believe it's only here when he says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. In other words, Paul doesn't say, Don't steal, and again I say don't steal. Don't envy, and again I say don't envy. So choosing joy must be a really big deal to God. 
He wants to bring us and give us joy. He wants to give us life. And I know some of you right now might be thinking, well, that's easy for Paul to say. Look at my life. Look at what took place in 2020. But I want to remind you that Paul wrote this from prison. He was chained to guards. He was unfairly incarcerated for his faith in Jesus. Paul was separated far from his family and far from his friends. And Paul just says, look me in the eye and says, choose joy. Put joy over despair. Let me make sure that when you hear me or that you hear me, choose joy. In fact, Paul would say all the other options, irritability, cynicism, anger, negativity, might be okay for other people. Might be okay for those who don't know Jesus, but not for you. Paul's saying, well, I want to remind you that Jesus came and he died and he arose. And the good news is he brings joy and I want you to be full of it. And you and I need to challenge one another with this. We oftentimes say, I want you to hold me accountable. Hold me accountable with my mouth. Help me, hold me accountable with my recovery from alcohol Hold me accountable in honoring my relationships, but seldom do we say, hold me accountable to living in joy. I do a lot of traveling, and I see too many Christians who turn into nitpicking, joy suckers, mad about something. They're mad about their job. They're mad about the church. They're mad about their team. They're mad about positive are posting negative comments on social media. In fact, these are the kind of people the restaurant servers tell me they're the last people they want to wait on. A preacher friend of mine tells the story that, uh, you know, he was just having a bad weekend, took his wife out for a nice steak dinner. They sat down for steak, and the steak was uh, overdone. So he called the waitress over, said the steak is too well done. She took it back. Brought the other steak out, says, no, now it's not cooked, done enough, so she took it back. And he said a third time he called, and he called the waitress over, and, she, and he said to her, this potato is bad. He said she literally reached down, picked up the potato, went bad, 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 bad. Put it back on my plate and said, if this potato gives you any more trouble, let me know. He realized then he was the one who had the problem. Some of you right now are saying, I hear you, and I don't want to be this way. So here's some good news to bring you great joy. Jesus died for you, and he rose again to set you free. He rose again to give you a home in heaven, and he lives in you. So you can know joy even in the midst of pain. Paul writes this letter from a very difficult place. He says it twice, choose joy. And some of you right now might be saying, well, I, I, I can't do that. It's not me. It's not my gift. Joy has nothing to do with your gift mix or your personality type. Some of the most joyous people I know, some of the people I hang out with are actually introverts. And quite often, the least joy-filled people can be extroverts. They're the ones looking for the next party. They're the ones looking for the next friendship. At first, it may appear that they're happy and on the surface, but it just doesn't run very deep. The only way that joy is going to run deep comes from a relationship with the God who announced this is good news for all people. When the Holy Spirit comes, you have to choose to die daily, and He causes great things to happen. Once again, Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Doesn't matter your Myers-Briggs, doesn't matter your ideogram number. Doesn't matter if you've had a rough past or a rough last year. This joy is for all people. So when you and I gather together, there should be authentic joy. 
We should be the most joy-filled people on the planet, winsome and helpful. Doesn't matter if you're at the grain elevator or at the school or the restaurant or the department store, the North 40, the checkout line. In fact, one of the things that I've been finding myself saying a lot lately, you know, you get in line at a coffee shop or you get in line at a store and something goes wrong with the computer and they apologize and say, this is a first world problem. Most of our missionaries do not have the problems that you and I deal with, and they're content. If anybody has a reason to be full of joy, it's you and me. Philippians 4, 5, good news to all the people, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near. Gentleness means a sweet reasonableness. The Greek talks about or gets the idea from a nurse or a pediatrician, and she's in this office full of screaming kids. It's used to characterize a nurse who had the ability to calm down fussy kids. Joy-filled people are like that. They just have a reasonableness about them. They're non-argumentative. They're non-divisive. They don't fly off the handle. Usually they're good listeners. Uh, Their calm is evident to all. Would that be evident in your life? Is it because you're rooted in Jesus? Do you understand that the Lord is near and He's coming back? And he's with you right now, right now. See, the reality is this gentleness translates into joy. You're saying when everything else falls apart, I won't fall apart. When people freak out about politics and pandemics, when I have to deal with people who disappoint me, I can say in my spirit... I have good news that causes great joy. One of my favorite preachers, Mike Bro, writes, The Lord is alive. He is with me. He is coming back. My name is written in the book of life. Heaven is my real home anyway. When I think about my God who made the stars and named them, who took the earth and sea and framed them, he pulled back the ocean tides and restrained them, breathed life into his own and claimed them. When I think about my God, before he gave the wind direction, before he decided the moon's reflection, before he painted the leaves' complexion, he settled on us as his main affection. Despite our rebellion, he pursued us. When our skin, excuse me, when our sin skewed us, he viewed us priceless. He chose not to exclude us, nor to let grace elude us. Instead, he came to us. He shed his blood on the cross. He shook the earth's foundation, shut the gates of hell, shocked the world when he got up. No sin cannot choke us, crush us, or beat us. Shame will not conquer, dim, or defeat us. We are alive because he is alive. We rise up because he is risen. We love because he first loved us. So I choose joy. How you doing? (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So my home church has asked me to record a sermon.